Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here, episode 2477 of The Tom Woods Show. Delighted to be joined by Jeremy Carl, senior fellow at the Claremont Institute and author of the just about to be released book, The Unprotected Class, How Anti-White Racism is Tearing America Apart. Jeremy, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me on, Tom. It's a pleasure. You know, you hear a title like that, and you think, I've heard this all before. We all know, we, we live it every single day. But you know what? You don't. You actually don't know it. You don't know um, the, the scope of it. You don't know how, the, the, the breadth of it, just w- how many sectors of society this weird ideology has crept into uh, and, and what the overall end game of it is. Th- this is a tremendous book. It's no wonder that it's, it's garnered the accolades that it has already. I will say, as we were talking before, that it, it is in a way almost like a, a course in this subject. And yet something tells me, Jeremy, that this book will not wind up on the syllabus of any of these anti- new anti-hate departments that are popping up in in various places. For some reason, that yeah, surprise seems to run only one way. Yeah, no, I think, of course, that's right. And um, I think you're also right, of course. I'm sure an audience that's a sophisticated audience about this sort of stuff like yours is, they're like, oh, yeah, well, we've, we've heard this song and dance before. And I partially wrote it even for those folks to say, hey, you know, there's a much bigger story here even. It's more expansive than... Uh, you even realize, and and here's a kind of a broad survey course of what this looks like across, you know, ten or eleven different areas of society, and then kind of try it all together. But I also wrote it if if some of your your know, listeners have parents or whatever or kids or and they're maybe not totally convinced that this is in fact the case. I tried to write it in a way that it doesn't scare off that kind of normal good natured, you know, wants to believe in the system type person. It just adjusts the facts, ma'am, with the, uh, you know, 973 sources or whatever I ended up doing on it. Um, and, and so that's really kind of the, the way that I wrote the book. Well, let's start with uh, the issue of civil rights law, but not spend that much time on that. Not that it isn't yeah. important, but as I've heard you say in interviews, other people, uh, including your colleague, Christopher Caldwell, have recently, um, done a pretty good deep dive on that subject as have I yeah. on this show, but yet you can't, you know, it is the, it is kind of the elephant in the room. You can't not talk about it. I do think there's been a, a very, very, um, perhaps modest, but nevertheless perceptible shift in the Overton window about what you're allowed to say on this subject. You can say, wait a minute, maybe all these problems we're having are not surprising perversions of otherwise wonderful things. I think we've gone down that road an awful lot of time. It's all well-intentioned things. And, and, and by the way, I'll say, let me say in parentheses, sometimes it can be the case that the text of something can itself be unimpeachable, but the left has its agenda and it will find that phrase here and there, or it will plant time, textual time bombs in there that nobody interprets in a particular way until after right. the thing is all over. And, and I, by the way, as a Catholic in, in, uh, after the Second Vatican Council, that's exactly what the left did. But most people looked at those documents and said, oh, this all looks pretty good. And then the left would find this phrase and that phrase and that phrase, and they would make that into the whole council. Yeah. No, they're expert in that. And you're absolutely right. And and you're absolutely right, of course, to say that I, I think the Overton window has shifted a little bit on this issue, and I'm trying to make it really shift a little bit more. And, and I'd say this, at least as a matter of strategy, and to some degree also even as a matter of substance, I don't think it's useful to relitigate the 1964 Civil Rights Act because it's here. Um, it was responding to real um, challenges at the time and it addressed, at least in the short term, some of those challenges. The question is, we're as far from that time right now as they were from the Wright brothers. So it was addressing the challenges of a society 60 years ago. We've moved on to a very different set of challenges. There are, as Christopher Caldwell says it was kind of a second constitution and it, it sort of overrode some fundamental rights that we had in our original constitution. And I would just say that I think it's time for, as, as part of many things that we need to do, kind of relooking at how we do that uh, and, and work within that system entirely. And that means reworking civil rights law in pr- pretty fundamental ways. And you're absolutely right, by the way, to use this textual 
um, uh, kind of games that the left likes to play as an example. And one of the biggest examples, because some of the worst things that came out of that act, if you go back and read the legislative debates on things like what became disparate impact, um, they're like, oh, no, no, you know, there would never be quotas. There'd never be disparate impact. Absolutely not. And and uh, 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 Senator Humphrey, who had been one of the main sponsors of the Civil Rights Act, kind of famously said, I, I will eat the text of this bill if there's any quota in there. Well, look, functionally, we basically got quotas over time. And so we just need to be realistic about that. And again, you know, I just think for political and other reasons, maybe not so useful to like relitigate every aspect of that past, but it is simply to say like different set of problems and we need to really completely reconceptualize the way that we're thinking about these issues. And that means um, some new legislation in this area, I think. Now, your book covers so many areas and, and I, you can understand why, but I don't think anyone's ever done it this thoroughly, which is probably why you did do it. So we're talking about observing this phenomenon in healthcare, in the mainline churches, in big business, big tech, schools, entertainment. There's so much. And I, I want to get to some of the, the hot ones. So I'd, I'd actually like to start, if you don't mind, with the, the subject of real estate and white flight. Now, what's the standard story of so-called white flight? And what, now I realize you wrote an entire chapter on this, so right. you know, summarize this however you like, but, but how are you reconceptualizing? Sure. So I think the standard story would be the one, and I tell it actually in the book, um, that Michelle Obama tells in her autobiography, which is, and she even has this phrase where she says, you white people, it's not, I, mean, I don't want to make her sound excessively, she's not quite as hostile as it sounds like, you, you know, you ran from us and you never stopped running. And she's talking very much about her experience moving to Chicago or moving to sort of a wider area of Chicago in the 50s or whatever with her family or 60s. And then pretty soon there's fairly dramatic white flight and this heavily white area becomes an almost entirely black area. Um, what I kind of show in the book, in, and um, I'm here kind of recapitulating some work that's been able to be done now, kind of on the edges, but just hasn't got as much publicity as we'd like. Jack Cashel wrote an interesting personal book called Untenable about his own family's experience in Newark as a white ethnic family in, in looking at these issues. But what I try to show is basically... Look, was there were there some people who just left because they didn't like minorities and they you know that was it? Yeah, there were probably some, um, but really the dominant thing, the dominant sort of trend, and and this was shown with respect to Michelle Obama's family is these neighborhoods just became really unsafe. People didn't want to um, leave established communities, established institutions, neighborhoods they knew and loved, all these things. For that sort of thing to happen, very, very extreme negatives had to, to, to be propped up. And, you know, when you begin to get some of the race riots and so every, every other things, it just became, as, as Jack Cashel titled his book, it became untenable for a lot of whites to stay. And so they didn't. Uh, and they were ultimately blamed uh, for that and kind of called Nazis and racist by, of course, a bunch of white people who normally weren't living around uh, minorities at all. And so what I kind of say somewhat provocatively is that white flight was really the only form of ethnic cleansing for which the victims were primarily blamed. Um, and that's not the whole story, but I think it's a really important part of the story that we're not telling. Well, what exactly was it that was so bad that made, that caused this phenomenon in the first place? I'm sure people have been living where they'd been living quite happily for quite some time. Yeah. Well, it was just it was violence, crime, safety. Uh, there's a there's a particular case in um, in looking. There was a book written even about Michelle Obama's uh, neighborhood in Chicago, and uh, by somebody who'd lived there, a white ethnic who'd lived there, and he kind of points to this turning point when this kind of beloved toy store owner Manny Lazar is just shot and killed in cold blood. So people are only willing to have so much risk to their safety. And so that was kind of the, and then of course, you know, you have the collapsing schools and everything else. And it's not that racism is completely absent from the story, but you don't need racism as an explanatory variable to just be like a social scientist to uh, look at that sort of a situation and say, hey, people are going to want to leave in that type of a, a scenario. And yet, so what is the connection then between this phenomenon and 
the anti-white racism that you're talking about in your book. Sure. So, I mean, I think, firstly, it was just uh, because one of the things I talk about is, and the reason why I didn't use the word racism rather than discrimination in the title is because at times there is just formal discrimination going on, okay? That's sort of like what a lot of this affirmative action so-called is. I mean, it's just, it's formal discrimination against whites. But there's a lot of things that are also informal that are cultural, that are better described as racism. So I think the fact that whites were blamed for this thing, the middle and working class whites for whom they were victimized, and I talk a lot about blockbusting, and it's kind of interesting. And so blockbusting was this phenomenon of the mid-20th century where uh, real estate speculators who invariably did not live in the areas that they were trying to do this to kind of would scare people that, oh, the, you know, my neighborhood is going to suddenly, all the whites are going to flee it and, and various bad things are going to happen. If you look at, there's a very famous Saturday Evening Post uh, article that was written. You can find it online. Uh, again, I think it's from the 50s, maybe early 60s, called Confessions of a Blockbuster. And it's this interview with this anonymous real estate speculator who's involved in this. And one of the things that he says quite explicitly, um, but is also just implicit with everything throughout the article, is that while certainly there were um, innocent and totally well-meaning, uh, productive African-American families who experienced racism and racist behavior, or Hispanic families, similar thing, you know, when they, they moved on to these primarily white blocks. And that, I mean, that's absolutely, but that story has been told ad infinitum. Um, but the story that hasn't been told a lot was what they basically say, which is, you know, the people who were the biggest victims, the people who was this, the hardest for were these middle-class whites who maybe wanted to make things work, saw that it was just completely untenable in terms of their safety, in terms of their school, and, and had to leave and, and had to sell in many cases at a huge loss and lost all of their uh, home equity or, or whatever else. And, and he describes this in very emotional terms. Um, so you kind of lead, the, there's a lot of these, when we talk about the anti-white racism, there are a lot of these informal narratives that kind of color how we view everything that's going on in society around race. And that's kind of what has come from eras like the blockbuster era into the present era. I, you know, I, I'm I'm sorry, I'm going to skip around a bit, but I, I yeah. there are so many things I want to talk about, and also um, maybe some of the more unusual topics that people aren't expecting. So, when you talk about healthcare, I know that I can find statements from, well, I I bet it's the American Medical Association talking about, um, in effect, DEI and topics like that, and um, but is it more than just statements coming out of professional associations here? I mean, is, is there more than that to the story? Uh, absolutely. And I'm actually married to a physician, so I have a little bit of a window um, on that um, th uh, at a personal level. Um, so, A, I mean, the physicians, like, like many other things, the anti-whiteness has ratcheted up in the last 10 to 15 years dramatically from where it was. But it, it comes from everything, and, and, and here I don't want to get into a, a sub-discussion of the COVID vaccine, but I have to to a little bit of an extent. So obviously, people, and I'm sure listeners to your show, have varying views about the COVID vaccine, but the people who were at least promoting it, for the most part, thought it was a good thing to have, and yet we had racial hierarchies in many states, including my own, by the way, in terms of who would have eligibility for that vaccine. Um, and we're beginning to see the similar sorts of racial prioritization in some other areas. We're having increasing racial discrimination in medical school admissions. Um, we are having increasing anti-whiteness in the sorts of journal articles that can even get published. And white scholars who are working and, and physicians in certain areas are being told, hey, you can't publish in this area or you can only publish in this area if you have a minority co-author, or again, you can sort of go up and down the list of things going on in our medical care system and see that whites in some cases are being very formally disadvantaged in that system. 
Hey, everybody, quick word from Woods here. It's my goal to have the best supporters program out there, better than anything on Patreon or anywhere else. Support the Tom Woods Show, and not only do you get entry into my no-censorship Tom Woods Show elite group, but you also get the 16-page Tom Woods elite letter mailed to your home every month. Who else is doing that? This is all new material, completely different from the emails I send, and it is red hot. My supporters also get invites to my murder mystery dinner parties that I've been holding around the country. I'll be adding more cities soon to woodsmystery.com. I hold these in penthouse suites at luxury hotels with a beautiful catered dinner. It's a ton of fun. I also invite my supporters to my annual Christmas party. And the higher up you go as a supporter, the more things you get. Some supporters even get a small gift in the mail from me every month in addition to the newsletter. So go check it out, supportinglisteners.com. You will not believe all the goodies at supportinglisteners.com. And my profound thanks to all of you. Now that I, I've, I've, I've read about to some degree, of course, I know about the prioritization on the vaccine question. And, and you're right, regardless of what your opinion on those shots is, the point is the people who were saying that, you know, you stupid backward old white rube should have to get in the back of the line. We're not trying to benefit them thereby. That's correct. The, yeah, that's, exactly. Yeah, that's It the wasn't point. through their love of the white rubes. Yeah, it wasn't they saying, were, look, these shots ain't all they're cracked up to be. So <laughs> the, that, that is not what was going on. But, right. the, but the other thing is the, the, the fact that you, you cover uh, the churches. And in particular, I guess when we say the mainline churches, we're talking about a certain kind of I guess liberal Protestantism, and in, increasingly, I, you you practically have to add the Catholic Church to that because yep. the the administration of that is just uh, th- that's a classic example of leftism takes over your institution, and th- it it doesn't say well uh, let's l- let's try to have a meeting of the minds, and we'll bring in a few people who are like this and a few like that, which is how you know people on our side used to act until uh, yep. they realized what was being done to them. Uh, and, now, you know, by the way, parentheses, are you familiar with uh, Liberty Fund? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, Liberty Fund puts out classic books and inexpensive editions and very, very handsome editions, but they also hold these colloquia where they bring in scholars to discuss various texts. And I haven't been to one in a long time, but I remember one where very, very, in a very particular way, they had decided they were going to bring in some people on the left to have uh, an exchange with us. And and we're going to spend uh, Pierre Goodrich's money on that. And I thought, well, there's nothing strictly wrong with that. It is good to have an open discussion once in a while. But then I thought to myself, if there was a left-wing foundation that had like a nine-figure fortune, would it spend any of that money, even one cent, bringing Jeremy Carl in because they're curious about his opinions? You know, so they, yeah. they're completely different from us, but all yeah. right, end of parentheses. So uh, maybe that's why they're winning. So end of parentheses. But, but it, in terms it, of the church- I why they're winning. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what else, right? <laughs> right. You know, I mean, you put these two side by side, what, what do you think is going to happen? But in what form is this taking in, in what churches precisely? Yeah, so great question. Um, and it's I talk about this comprehensively and not even just in the church. I kind of talk about the Jewish community as well. Uh, I don't get into the LDS folks, but you could do this uh, just as well for them. There's a lot of overcompensation for some of their past sins uh, going on. But so most trivially, of course, actually, trivially, maybe not quite the right word, but most obviously the mainline Protestant church, okay? These are the so-called seven sisters. This is the Congregationalists. Presbyterian Church USA. These are the Episcopalians. These were kind of the pillars of the original WASP establishment in America. This was kind of where um, the American establishment would go to church on Sundays. So you've had two things that I would argue are probably uh, related that have gone on. One, membership in these churches has collapsed about as fast as it is humanly possible to collapse. In a lot of these churches, they're down 60 to 70 percent in 30 or 40 years. So huge collapse. What is that connected to? When you go to the Presbyterian Church USA or the Congregational Church websites, and I I point out a number of this specifically in the book, but it's like a parody of critical race theory. And it's almost like, well, why would I even need to go to church to this? This is, if I want far left, you know, Antifa Jason stuff, I'll just go to Antifa. I don't need to go to church to kind of hear about how my church is inherently white supremacist and even Christianity's history may be inherently white supremacist and all these sorts of things um, going on. That's kind of representative of the mainline church. Now, interestingly, um, two things. 
again, and I point these both out in the book, one, this disproportionately, although it does happen at the individual church level for sure, but the craziest stuff tends to happen outside of the view of congregants at these kind of national conventions where leadership gathers. And so a lot of congregants don't even understand um, the official position of their church. Secondly, these churches are to great disproportion white, okay? And so that in of itself, there's a certain amount of self-hatred, or if you want to have a different view of it, you could say that they are elevating themselves of otherwise those bad whites, those rubes out there. So that's the mainline church. Um, I argue that to an extent, and, and the similar thing is going on in the Catholic church. You mentioned you're Catholic. Um, you've had a kind of linear decline in mass um, attendance by like, like 50% since the 1970s, despite the fact you've had this huge influx of Hispanic, largely Catholics going on at that time. Um, and so the church is under huge demographic pressures to kind of toe, say, a big open borders line. And the number of Catholic prelates at this point of significance who are strong on border issues is not high, right? So you have that sort of thing going on in the Catholic church or particularly the, the Jesuits or some of these left-wing kind of groups or left-wing Catholic magazines. You see this going on. But what's, I think, even more surprising, and I say this as a, an evangelical myself, is the degree to which this has prop, popped up in the evangelical church. And so you have guys, again, I talk about this in the book, like Jamar Tisby, who are winning the biggest evangelical book awards, who are talking about, even until a couple years ago, Michael Brown, who was the guy in Missouri, the, the fake hands up, don't shoot narrative when this was a strong arm robber guy who was appropriately and justly uh, killed by a police officer when he was kind of um, proving to be a menace to the community in a, a very short term way. Um, the Michael Brown case was so absurd that even after the riots in Ferguson, Missouri that happened, even the radical Obama Justice Department kind of blew up this hands up, don't shoot narrative. They did not prosecute Darren Wilson, the officer in question. But here we've got these prominent evangelicals sort of saying, uh, hey, you know, like, I, let's, let's push this narrative. And in addition, and I'll, then I'll stop my soliloquy here on this particular subject. The other problem with this, and, and Vody Bauckham has written a really great book, uh, Baptist Pastor, called Fault Lines, uh, on this that I'd certainly recommend to people. It's a fundamentally, un, this racial essentialist guilt is just fundamentally unchristian at the most fundamental ways because what Christianity teaches us is that we're all sinners, we're all saved through the grace of Jesus Christ. Um, sin is not A, a function of our race or our racial history, and B, it's not something like systemic racism that we can never have atonement for. So that's kind of where we are. It is a deeply unchristian thing. Um, it is burrowed anti-white racism deeply into the church at all levels, and it's really concerning. All right. Well, now in this in this wild potpourri that we're we're doing here, um, let's. You know, the the thing is that what seems to be just such a behemoth that 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 it seems it difficult to to crack into is is the big business and big tech uh, area of things because it seems that this kind of ideology that you're describing is so uh, is so lodged there that even though I think you can see a bit of a backlash, not nearly as strong as it should be and not nearly a, a, among as many people as it should be, growing in society at large, uh, that, that's easy for us to say. But if you actually work in a corporate environment, uh, don't go around saying, well, I read Jeremy Carl's new book. You know, that no. is still imp an impossibility. Yeah. Well, and hopefully it'll be less of an impossibility over time. I mean, that's why I wrote the book. I didn't write this book to be on the very most outermost edges of some of the discussions and debates that people like you and I probably engage with, where it's kind of like the cutting edge of theory, the cutting edge of what's acceptable to say. What I'm actually trying to argue in this book, and again, this is why it's um, hopefully a book that, that a lot of people in the mainstream will read and 
why folks like Tucker Carlson and Charlie Kirk and Victor Davis Hanson endorsed it is that this is normal. We should be talking about this. We don't need to be ashamed or embarrassed or suggest that anti-white racism is not going on um, when it really clearly is. And um, so I, I'm trying to kind of destigmatize a lot of this debate through the book and say that that it should be mainstream to have these concerns. You know, it's not not some Ku Klux Klan plot that's going on here. But I, you know, the, the standard kind of response you might get, apart from you know, if if there's any any response at all after the name calling is over, yeah. would be something like, oh, boo hoo, you know, um, old white men are unhappy that. You yeah, know, the, the crimes of their ancestors are finally being called out. Well, right. you know, w- we've had to endure far worse than you have, and right. you know, what a bunch of crybabies you all are. Right. No, and I think that's right. That is exactly to the extent that you'll get a substantive uh, response at all. And I don't know if I can call that substantive, but you'll get that. So there's a couple responses. I mean, one is I don't think America has anything on balance to be ashamed of or apologetic for. I mean, there's certainly many bad elements in our history, and we, we can talk about that. And, and frankly, if you have a kid in government schools, or even if you don't, you do talk about that ad nauseum. And by the way, I'm 51. We talked about that when I was a kid in school. I mean, maybe not to the kind of absurd, ridiculous degree that it happens today, but this kind of notion that kids were never skeptically interrogating American history in school just does not bear out. But At the end of the day, I think we built this country that for all of its flaws is amazing. It's the best country. And I don't say that in a jingoistic way. I just think, look, this is still a place that everybody wants to come, um, including uh, it's the most popular half of sub-Saharan Africa and survey data wants to leave and U.S. is the number one destination, right? So um, that they want to go to. So so we're doing some things right here. I don't view, I view the overall history of the U.S. as something we should be proud of, not as a criminal enterprise. And ultimately, at the end of the day, also, the response for discrimination in the past is not to um, to kind of double down on the reverse discrimination. It's to try to treat everyone in an equal and fair way, regardless of their race uh, today. And that should be what we are ascribing to. And as, as uh, Thomas Sowell correctly says, the quest for cosmic justice kind of invariably just leads to greater injustice. Um, so that would be kind of my response to those folks. Hey, everybody, let's take a minute to thank our sponsor, Persist SEO. If you are getting buried by your competition online, then build your brand, your reputation, and your lead flow with digital marketing by Persist SEO. If you are a small local business trying to compete against large companies in the service industry, then increase your visibility with Persist SEO. Or what if you have low or no leads coming in on a consistent basis? Well, then website search engine and conversion optimization can help move the needle to a more prosperous business model for you. Are you tired of cold calling and networking, meeting places getting shut down? Use your website as a lead generation engine. Or what if you're not showing up for your services in the search engines? Well, get found with Persist SEO's expert search engine optimization. All you have to do is call 770-580-3736 or visit them at ineedseo.help for a free website audit and consultation. That's 770-580-3736 or ineedseo.help. You know, the, the, the fact that people are interested in what their favorite actors and actresses have to say about anything has always astonished me. There's no particular reason that they would have any insight into things that would be any more valuable than what you would get from a random schmo on the street. But unfortunately, this is where we are. And tabloids do very well, and people are interested in, in celebrity gossip and things I just can't even begin to fathom. But that is, that is where we are. And with the exception of a handful of them, every last one of them uh, has exactly the same ideas. I mean, what what are the odds, Jeremy? What are the odds? uh, That they would all have the same opinions. Well, you can sort of tell, I I, I can't remember where I read this from, but it was some Hollywood insider who basically said, you could tell who the conservatives in Hollywood are because they're the ones who actually never say anything about politics. Yeah, right, exactly, yep. (laughs) 
Um, and I think that's I think that's accurate. It is also sort of interesting as a parenthetical, as because I know you're a, a serious historian with appropriate graduate degrees, as as a kind of bit of social history that I've never seen fully explained. It used to be fully understood, almost even well into the 20th century, that actors in particular were sort of this sub-respectable cast, even though people went to shows and some of those guys were famous even in, you know, centuries ago and people appreciate what they did, but they were seen as kind of almost outcast societally in certain ways. And the notion that you would have ever paid any attention to what they thought about anything in the public realm would have just been seen to have been absurd. And somehow the celebrity culture of the mid 20th century has turned around such that what Taylor Swift says about politics is, is like super important. Um, and I, I don't kind of know that whole history, but it's, it's kind of a fascinating one. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. But so, so here we are um, in, in a situation in which the entertainment world can always be relied to jump on board uh, whatever the latest elite obsession is. So it yeah. could be, if it's climate, then it'll be climate. If it's uh, right. wear a mask, it's wear a mask. I mean, I remember, I mean, I have a soft spot in my heart for Alyssa Milano only because when um, Dr. Paul was in poor health, she uh, tweeted out a, a, a message of, of good wishes to him, which is more than you can oh, say for great. a lot of the human race. But But I remember her putting on this knit mask with the, with the holes in it that were so big that even if you bought into all this, there's no way that mask is going to do anything. You know, yeah. I, mean, I mean, it would be like having a wire fence to keep mosquitoes out, right? That made yeah. no sense at all. But but whatever it is, they are the first, whatever emoji they need to have in their in their social media avatars, they do it. So what is that? Wh how is they? Wh what do we hear in terms of your you know the anti white ideology you're talking about? What do we hear most from, like, what's the refrain from the Hollywood crowd on this? Sure. Well, this is actually interesting because Hollywood, and to the extent that you view that as a, a culture maker or the dream factory, as it's sometimes been called, has really been at the avant-garde of a lot of this stuff. And that you really can go back to the 1960s in Hollywood and where it's everything from Sachin Littlefeather, the fake Native American, giving Marlon Brando's um, acceptance speech at the Oscars to... Uh, denounce the kind of white supremacist taking of her Native American lands. Now, of course, keep in mind, she wasn't actually Native American at all. That didn't come out until a little after her death a couple of years ago. Um, but but you have these sorts of things. And actually, statistically, and I cite this in my book, The Under Unprotected Class, you can go back and look. And even starting in the 1960s, minorities are prepare, are presented on average in movies in a more positive light than whites. And we even have what's called, and this has even been adopted by leftist uh, scholars, this kind of idea of what's called in quotes, and I'm using their phraseology here, the magical Negro. And that's this black person. And, and you can almost think of some roles that um, uh, Morgan Freeman has had in his career, who takes these benighted white people who are making all these mistakes and comes in with his superior wisdom and sort of explains um, everything that uh, they should be doing and that's going on and has this kind of superior wisdom to the point that this has actually become a trope almost in movies. And again, you see this starting even in the 1950s. But then you begin to have even more, and again, I'll, I'll decide to talk about it in much more great deep depth in the book. You look at movies like Black Panther or Get Out, and there's pretty overt... Um, anti-white ideologies um, that that the directors have even confessed to, uh, if that's the right term, right up at the front. Or you have more interesting cases still, like Hamilton, um, the big Broadway success, which in some ways, I mean, I think Hamilton artistically, I, yeah, I have to give uh, the creator his due. I think there's a lot of artistically interesting there. But um, the casting choices, such that the one... Uh, kind of villain, kind of, well, there may be two villains, but the, the kind of principal villain with no redeeming qualities, King George III, is the only white guy cast in that film or, or in that in that musical. Um, and then furthermore, the historical erasure of kind of the reality of the white founders. I mean, my, even some of my own younger kids, at first I kind of had to explain to them that no, the founders weren't actually minorities 
Um, this is and then this is not an idiosyncratic thing to me. This has uh, been documented with some people who who don't understand the real founding story. So Hamilton is a little more of a complicated case, but it is another really prominent case in which a certain amount of anti-white ideology, even as it nominally celebrates the founders, has creeped into some of our biggest entertainment products. And the thing is that it, it only goes one way. And we right. all know that. So as usual, it's always it's always double standards. It's always there's never actually any principle at work unless the principle is whatever advances my agenda is acceptable. That seems to be the principle. And sure. I think that's been hard. I, I mean, now th this might sound, um, I don't care how it sounds. I think a lot of what's happened, I think the reason so many people have become shell-shocked over all this is that they've assumed that other people are as, you know, basically fair-minded as they are. That if I make some concessions and I indicate I have appropriate contrition, even for things I myself didn't do, and I try to meet people halfway, then, you know, reasonable people will, you know, will meet me halfway and we'll work this whole thing out. And that's not what's going on. Like, if this is a winner take all, um, you are going to be humiliated and ground into the dirt kind of fight. Right. That since, since, since most people themselves don't act that way, they tend to project their basic innocence onto everybody else. No, that's, I think that's absolutely right. And, and uh, we were talking before the, the show. I mean, I was a, a big Ron Paul supporter in 2008, and that's where I, I think I first came across you and some of your work. And I think there are a lot of really well-intentioned people who are uh, were in that kind of camp. And I think my fundamental critique, and I would have even had this at the time, I didn't go into that with my eyes closed, is that fundamentally decent people like Ron Paul who act with sincerity sort of expect that that's going to be returned. And in fact, that's just not politics. I mean, I think a more serious understanding of politics, particularly in an increasingly fractious, multicultural, multiracial society, is there's a lot more of just power and to the victor go the spoils. And that's just what it is. And a lot of people who are very principled find that understandably very unappealing. But we can't take the politics out of politics. And the left has been willing to use its governmental power, to use its force, to use its control unashamedly to ad advance an anti-white agenda, among many others, over several decades. Meanwhile, we are simply making airy appeals to principle that are good principles, but we're just getting steamrolled. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You know, one of the great benefits of your book is that the phenomenon you're describing exists in so many examples that we see in the headlines every day that if somebody were inclined to write a book about it, I think by the time they get the idea, they'd think, oh, but there I've already seen and forgotten about 8 million examples I'd want to use, and I don't even know if I'd be able to find them. And it yeah. seems overwhelming because there are so many examples. Well, you've done it for us now. So we don't yeah. have to, because I have thought about writing something like this, and I thought, oh, it just seems exhausting. How would I dig up all this stuff that I've been reading about and well i don't know how you did it but you did it and now i don't have to do it yeah well i've, I've tried to and, and i do actually sort of joke in the uh in the preface it, i could have written just for the reasons you said a comprehensive book like this would have been 10 volumes yeah and i also sort of say to the specialists because i i know there will be folks like you with a sort of greater degree of of sophistication and understanding on these issues who are reading it i kind of overtly apologize at the beginning i say look this is a survey course, okay, of this issue. So I'm going to give you 20 pages on Hollywood and 30 pages on the church and, uh, you know, 35 pages on crime. Um, but, and, and there are people who have, if for some of these issues, written entire books, but they haven't connected the anti-white phenomenon in these disparate areas. So I'm like, look, I apologize. I'm going to probably leave out some of your favorite examples for X or Y or Z, what I'm trying to do is both hopefully even educate the experts to a degree, but also to reach the open-minded, the normie, if you will, non-expert who's just like, oh gosh, you know, maybe I'd be willing to consider this thesis and then come up with a comprehensive book that really does look into this. And I, I spent, uh, again, a, lo a long time on it because the, the research really was uh, heavy. It's actually not quite as intimidatingly long a read as it looks. It just got 75 pages of endnotes with all of the uh, references to uh, to specific uh, items that I'm covering. 
Well, the book, uh, once again, is um, The Unprotected Class, How Anti-White Racism is Destroying America by Jeremy Carl. I strongly recommend it. You can check it out. Um, you'll have a link to the, uh, to the book in the description of the video and also on the show notes page, which is tomwoods.com slash 2477. This is one of the most momentous things that's going on in the country. And, and of course, obviously this plays into, or vice versa, the demographic changes play into this uh, that have been going on in the U.S. That obviously is, these are not separate questions. And you do spend some time talking about that. So it's, it really is a, it's comprehensive in the sense of the scope, the scope of it. But, but nobody could assemble every single individual case. But you'll see uh, plenty of evidence in one area of American society after another that something deeply sick and wrong has taken root. And I guess as we part, uh, Jeremy, uh, you know, I, we, we live in such a frustrating time that I hate to end an episode with, okay, well, all this crazy nonsense is going on. Uh, thanks for listening. Do you, do you have a glimmer of hope for us? I do. And I, I, in fact, I spend the last chapter doing uh, just that, talking about the glimmer of hope. Before I get into the glimmer of hope, let me do my own uh, shameless self-plug. Uh, and you can go on Amazon, et cetera, and order this book right now or wherever. If you have a, a conservative book outlet or whatever, you can certainly also get it there. But if you want to follow me and learn more about the book and everywhere I'm going to be appearing, because I'm actually just kicking off a, a nationwide tour, um, I you can go to my my uh, Twitter uh, p uh, feed, which is, or excuse me, X feed now, Real Jeremy Carl, or to my Substack, which is new, and I'm getting off the ground and, and talking a lot about these issues. The Course of Empire. That's JeremyCarl.substack.com. But now let me kind of after uh, shameless promo. Oh, and by the uh, way, it's Carl with a C. Let me just specify. Carl with a C. Yes, thank yeah. you. Okay. Um, so what do we do about this? So I kind of list six informal things and six formal things. I won't talk about them all, but I'll just do a few of them. The the kind of informal thing I think we can do. Um, that probably works at the end of the day for a lot of people. There's a race and ethnicity scholar, Canadian by origin, but he teaches in the UK at, at the University of Buckingham. He was at Birkbeck College before that for a long time, named uh, Eric Kaufman, and he wrote a book called White Shift. And uh, uh, Professor Kaufman is himself kind of multiracial, although maybe uh, he's partially Hispanic, he's partially Asian, kind of presents as white phenotypically, if you were, will. Um, but what he essentially argues is rather than getting caught up in these racially essentialist views of whiteness that are probably going to be a political dead end in a country that in the next 20 years will be minority white and kind of go down from there, that we need to sort of expand um, what some scholars would, would call, I mean, I, he often calls it white shift and I use it in this, but in a, some scholars would call it an ethnogenesis. Um, so you're essentially creating a new American ethnicity. So where would you do this to kind of create a new American majority? So there's a lot of Hispanics who self-identify as white, for example, right now. Um, you have significant intermarriage within that community already with, with uh, white non-Hispanics. So you're going to have these um, multiracial groups, same thing with Asians, lots of different groups. Right now, the way our system is set up, and this goes from the census to civil rights laws to affirmative action to have it, whatever, there is no incentive for those groups to identify with the American historic majority. There's no incentive for them to identify with our, our history. Now, of course, I'm not suggesting that that doesn't mean that some of them do it anyway, but it's to their detriment, <clears throat> at least in terms of official benefits that they might get. So if you get rid of these official benefits that cause a flight from whiteness, um, you could kind of reconstitute an American ethnic majority over time um, by just kind of incorporating some of the folks you have here. And if you combine that with a more formal policy of what I would argue, at least as our going in point, is a net zero immigration, doesn't mean that we have zero people coming in, period, but it means we're kicking out, well, first of all, we should be kicking out every illegal, but we're, uh, we're certainly scrutinizing really, really heavily anybody that we are bringing in, and we're trying to kind of match that up one-to-one oh, -one with, with people, the, the illegals that we're kicking out. Um, Again, this is not a pipe dream. At some small level, we kind of had this as our immigration regime to a degree uh, between 1924 and 1965 after the Johnson-Reed Amendment. So that's some things we can do. We touched on this earlier in the broadcast, but I think a wholesale reconception of civil rights laws, um, 
in some cases, just taking things off the books. In other cases, matching them up better to uh, consistent with the freedom of association and consistent with the actual problems we're facing in the year 2024, which are not Hispanic people are not allowed to sit at this lunch counter, but that we have a lot of really dubious discrimination lawsuits going on. So these sorts of things are better. I think there are going to be elements, this is more informal again, of, of civil disobedience. I think there is at some level no substitute um, for actually, this is not something that's comfortable for the right to do, but you got to put bodies in the streets sometimes to show that you're you're serious. I don't mean dead bodies. I mean live bodies. I should should uh, should act. And then I'd say maybe one other formal thing. Again, this is in no way comprehensive. I'm just giving you a few highlights. Is to really embrace lawfare against some of the very formal anti-white racism that is going on. And in fact, I think the most successful group that has come out of the Trump administration, Stephen Miller, is America First Legal. Uh, Stephen Miller was the head of domestic policy for Trump and was a particularly an immigration expert. They are just suing left, left and right about all sorts of anti-white discrimination that is clearly obviously facially illegal and that white people have just been so Stockholm syndrome that we've allowed this to happen for a long time. And they're just saying, hey, you can't do this. Um, this, is, this is a blatant violation, even of our existing bad civil rights laws in which uh, they do cover whites as well. Um, and... So these things have never really been challenged before. And what's happening is America First Legal is winning a lot of these cases because they have the law on their side. But until they went in and began pursuing some of these legal avenues, uh, nothing was going on. So I think we need to take what that group is doing, and there are a few other groups, and we need to 100x the, what, we're, what we're doing in this area. So those would be a few things that I think um, we could do positively. I am not blackpilled. I think there's a lot of cause for concern, but America has come back from worse situations than we're in right now. And I hope that my book opens up a discussion for how we can come back uh, from this situation as well. Well, Jeremy, thank you for your time today. Best of luck on the tour. The book is The Unprotected Class. Check the video description as well as tomwoods.com 2477 for the link. And thank you very much for your attention, ladies and gentlemen. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.